thank everybody for attending uh, this event today. First of all, I want to say that uh, I hope that everybody out there is fine and safe, and also the families. Here we are, luckily we are fine. Uh, my name is Jose Maria Fraile, call me in a short way Jose, and I've been in the wine business all my life, since uh, 92. And um, one of the key things why I'm in this business is my father, and also my partner today, uh, Alicia, who is uh, partnered with me in tandem, and she's a winemaker. We met back in 92, uh, in a completely different business, uh, in a different winery in another part of Navarra, uh, where we worked for five years together. Then the path uh, changed for both of us. We left that company and um, I worked five years for, for a big winery in Navarra. Alicia uh, left that winery to consult in different wineries in Navarra and Rioja. And then there is a moment in life uh, that some people is, uh, is called the moment of, uh, you know, being in a sense an entrepreneur, uh, find your passion, uh, take a step of adventure or something. And once the train is there waiting for you and you take the decision, you cannot uh, go back. And um, probably in 2002, I found that moment in which uh, luckily I said, I have to do something different. And, in this business, as you know, in the wine business, uh, the cost of entrance is, is high. It's difficult to start a new business because you have to invest a lot of money. Uh, but we didn't have the money, but we had the, the passion, the right age and the expertise. I, I couldn't only at that time in my life start this new project. It's, it's for me a life project. And why was I in that um, you know, station of adventure about to take the train? It's, because um, I had work and I, I knew as a friend, Alicia. Alicia for me is, you can never say the best of anything, but for me is probably the best or one of the best one makers in Spain. So um, Alicia finally was convinced by me, by me, luckily. And in 2003, we founded together with, uh, with a group of uh, friends and most of my family, we founded Tandem. And we named it Tandem that for anyone, uh, even for me, it was uh, two people doing something, like a, like a tandem paraglide or a tandem bike. Uh, I didn't know that tandem is a Latin word that means finally. So that was the main meaning for me behind tandem. Uh, finally, uh, we uh, fulfill or started to fulfill a dream. That's, uh, that's a key point for us and, and summarizes a lot of the passion that we we try to drive because this is only the beginning. So um, an important fact of, uh, of uh, our philosophy is that Alicia started making wines back in 89, 1989 in Bierzo. At that time, Bierzo was not known in Spain at all. It was not uh, Mencia, it was not a, a grape that was a record or had no prestige uh, as it has today. And when Alicia arrived in Bierzo, at that, uh, back in 89, uh, there was no steel and steel. It was only concrete tanks in the winery she worked for uh, for a couple of years. Um, that's important because um, there Alicia in Bierzo learned the principles of minimal intervention. Uh, and uh, well, this is something that she learned back in 89, 90, a couple of vintages. She came in Navarra in 91 and she did completely different things. But when we in 2002, the end of 2002, uh, decided to start Tandem. We said, how do we want Tandem to be? We want Tandem to be a minimal intervention winery. For us, less is more. And the principles she learned in Bierzo, the, the fermentation and the aging in concrete, sounded like something that we wanted for our winery. So the first step we took to be consistent in quality is to try and to try to find a partner who would own grapes, uh, a number of grapes, about 20 hectares or so, that would invest with us in the winery. And we were very lucky to find Pedro. Pedro Lizarraga is our grower partner, viticulturist partner. And uh, his vines are at uh, just um, seven kilometers from the winery in the Yerri Valley, where we are based. 
I think uh, if uh, I move my camera over there, you will be able to see uh, the valley in front of the winery. This is called the, the Yarri Valley. So Pedro, with his 22 hectares planted in the 80s, Tempranillo, Cabernet and Merlot, uh, basically three thirds, uh, invested with uh, Alicia and me in the winery. And as I said before, with my parents, my parents-in-law, my sisters, all the people that I love. So it's a, it's a big, a high responsibility uh, moving the business forward. So now we have the grapes and um, a very important fact also for us is what we are in, where we are in Navarra. Uh, the Yerri Valley is particularly a very special valley. Navarra is placed, um, I don't know if maybe later on you can raise some questions, but uh, I guess that most of you know Spain. Uh, as you know, we border with, uh, with uh, France in the north. And Navarra is a region that we do not touch the sea by just a few kilometers. Uh, San Sebastian and Fontarrabia are very nearby. So we have a border with France in the Pyrenees. Um, it has a, a shape like a, like a, like a pyramid, no, no, like a diamond, right? And Pamplona, the capital, is in the center. From Pamplona to the north, there are no vines. No, no, no vine growing in, the, in that part of in the north. So the wine region is from Pamplona to the south. And we are very lucky to be in the northwestern corner. Uh, Navarra itself is like a little continent. North to south, east to west is very different. Uh, for instance, in the south we have a desert. Uh, shootings of uh, Game of Thrones were in, in the south of Navarra in the desierto de Bardenas, in the desert of Bardenas. And it's super dry and very, very hot. In the north, we can see shots of the Pyrenees and we, we have bears and so it looks a little bit like, it could be look, looking like Canada. So the wine region is also very different. And one thing that Alicia and I have in common is that uh, the style that we like is, uh, is cool climate uh, style. And here in the Yerri Valley, we are blessed with a beautiful microclimate to grow vines because we have a high altitude, 600 meters altitude, we have a lot of rain, so no irrigation at all, and no, no irrigation pipes. And uh, we have a very cold winter uh, it, uh, with a lot of rain and snow. Every single winter we get snow. Sometimes it could be hard and with big storms and we can get uh, here at the winery uh, snow for three, four days. Um, but always in the mountains, we will see a lot of snow. Um, so very cold, uh, humid um, winters, and the summer here is very is very hot, as it is uh, not so much today. We are we are half around 26, 27 degrees today. Uh, but something really really important that I know better today than I knew back in 2003, uh, the summer nights the temperature cools down, and the, the the thermal difference between the day and the night is 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 very high, it's dramatic. And this is very important for the style of the vines, of the wines, because the grapes is, is like a little truth to the, to the grapes, to the vines. Um, they recover in, in, the, in the night, and the next day they look fresh and bright and ready to extend a very hot day. And these this very uh, cold nights allow a very slow ripening process. And the thing is that, um, we are normally picking in between, in between three and four weeks later in the south of the region. And this late ripening, this very slow, slow cycle of the grapes is very important for the style of the wines because at the end, what we get is natural acidity. To me, back in 2003, it was something that probably I didn't understand because uh, any wine that Alicia made in Navarra uh, before Tandem, somehow in many, many of the wines, the acidity was corrected with natural things like uh, things that I from from wine like uh, tartaric acid and so on but since we are in tandem 2003 was the first vintage nothing we have never used uh, needed to correct the acidity in the wines and this is very important for us because I always say that uh, uh, may the wines be beautiful correcting the acidity we believe they can of course but can it be the same I've as if the acidity is natural, we always believe that nature is, is wiser and would, will do things in a, in a perfect uh, measure, in a perfect way. And um, 
later on when we release the wines into the market and uh, talk to professionals i learn about words names like mountain wine and and then you, you picture and, and you taste the difference these wines uh, were named by by professionals by cr wine critics by wine importers as mountain wines and when you taste wine from a from a warm area uh, bold and you know you feel the alcohol and well, they, they may be beautiful but this is a different style these these are completely different uh, here you feel the the freshness and the elegance and this is something that I, we particularly enjoy uh, from the cool style we have in the in the Yerri Valley. So um, in the winery, when we designed it, designed the winery back in 2003, four was the construction. We said uh, this minimal intervention has to reflect also in the winery, and we based the idea uh, on what Alicia saw in Bierzo back in, two, in, in 1989. And also in the way things were done in, in the houses, uh, in the old times when people in every house, in every little town, in Navarra, in Rioja, people would um, make wine at home for the home consumption. And it was always done in the, in the basement where it was easy to bring the, uh, the grapes by gravity from the uh, upper level. And also uh, in the basement, you can control temperature naturally. And this is something very important when you are fermenting or when you are storing wine. So we were lucky, very lucky, I was very lucky to find this uh, piece of land, which is just in front of uh, Pedro's Vines at seven kilometers in the Yerri Valley, where we wanted to be in the coolest part of the appellation and with a natural slope. So we built the winery uh, completely fully in concrete and partially underground. Because the idea was to bring, like in the old times, the grapes from the upper part directly into the uh, stainless steel tanks where we ferment, and then the process will follow on uh, by gravity, having concrete baths in the lower story. So uh, the, the whole building is, is built in concrete with very wide uh, walls in the, in, in the bottom because it's, it's the foundations of the, of, the, of the winery. And this allows uh, the wines to be in perfect temperature in concrete and on the ground, winter and summer, because the thermal lag of the building works incredible. Um, we know that any wine that we keep in concrete, um, when we leave, uh, let's say, on holidays in the beginning of August, and we are back uh, at the end of August to prepare the, the harvest, any wine that we keep in concrete, uh, as long as we want, will be even better than the moment in which we put put the wine in concrete. This is a this is a a paradise for any winemaker. Um, there is certain ideas, uh, you know, it's, it's also by tasting wines, that wines kept in steel and steel uh, may develop certain um, metal loads, reduction, and so on. Whereas the wines that we keep in concrete are in heaven. This is for us the, the land of, of the winery. I must say as well that um, these concrete tanks are in the old times when Alicia arrived in Bierzo, it was just concrete and the wines were in contact with concrete. But the first thing she did in, in Bierzo was paint on epoxy, those tanks. Uh, is epoxy, as you know, is, is mm, a food paint that um, makes the tanks be completely safe to store any, any food product. Uh, you can store milk, you can store water or wine because in the old times one was in contact with concrete directly and this is you can get some dirt and you have also the metal parts in the composition of the of the concrete and uh, wines wine bites everything and uh, it could be a little bit um, dangerous for wine and i think it's one of the things that uh, condemn uh, many many tanks all over spain to disappearance because when subsidies arrive from from europe into spain uh, to cooperatives to invest in the, um, you know, in, in, in the wineries. Uh, there was a, a huge amount of money invested in stainless steel to tear apart, to tear apart uh, concrete but, uh, but They were completely destroyed. And today, winemakers know that uh, winemaking in concrete is, is really phenomenal. And um, later on, um, when you have the wines in the market and you talk to professionals, 
we at the end are humble wine makers. Uh, we we go out there with our wines, uh, with with all the optimism, the emotion, and everything. But you you are in front of a professional that is really uh, a high profile and that tastes wine from all over the world every day. We cannot pretend to be like they are. I mean, the knowledge is phenomenal as well, and um, uh, the fact that. Um, they appreciate what we do is is incredible and discussing particularly with uh, the people the buyer at uh, Hogarth and with Steve which has been also a big inspiration for us he always said to me uh, Jose the way you produce wines uh, you can use a screw cup because uh, they, they you you wine make traditionally and the, the amount of oxygen oxygen in the wine is, is already enough you don't need to do anything else and screw up would be fantastic for you Plus, he said, uh, regardless of the time you keep the wines in concrete, because the, uh, the concrete tanks are epoxy lined, there is no oxidation through. The, uh, there is no oxidation, which means the, the fruit is preserved beautifully. So that's, that's incredible. The wines can be kept in concrete for two, three, four years. They will, they will be uh, slowly maturing, slowly you know, getting more complex. You have the fine leaves in the tank and they, get, they keep getting complexity, but there is, no, uh, uh, there is no reduction, there is no oxidation, there is no fruit lost. And this is something which is something that is, is a pleasant for us. Why do we keep the wines in concrete for so long? This is something that we never thought about. Uh, but one day back in 2000, probably four or five, Alicia said to me, I think the wines are stable without fining. And I said, that sounds good to me. If we do not find the wines, we can't do less. I mean, this is minimal intervention as, at, at its best. Uh, there is nothing less we could do. And um, one day I got in the winery and I got two glasses blind. And then Alicia said to me, taste. And I said, uh, Alicia, for me, this is Arsnova, one of the wines that we're going to taste today but I, I don't know why I prefer this one to that one. And she said to me, me too, this is the unfine. I took 50 liters, the little proof with the lightest fining method possible, possible, and this is the difference. So we, as I said before, we keep learning and we learned that any process that you, to, you do to a wine, to a mast, from using a pump to whatever, to very carefully fine, uh, the, the wine is losing uh, properties is losing complexity and the thing is that when you take a when you take a step you, you have to go on you cannot go backwards you cannot define you cannot de pump or you cannot you know escape from something that you have already done you you have to go on so minimal intervention at tandem is is uh, glorious and is the way we do things and we are very proud of it we are just three people at the winery Alicia, who is uh, very, we do a lot of tasks, uh, Alicia, myself, but we also have uh, someone that is incredible, is our cellar master. Josean is an incredible person that uh, takes care of, care of the vines, does all the processes in the winery. I call him MacGyver because uh, with a little piece of wire, he can do anything. And this is, this is for any company having the, the best people is, is fantastic and we have, uh, we have the best. I didn't mention that, uh, well, I did mention that we ferment in a stainless steel. So we have a two-story building that if possible, we will try to see later. Um, and in, in the upper story, we have the stainless steel tanks that we ferment. Uh, Alicia believed when we designed the winery that for the fermentation, stainless steel would be better because you can control temperature uh, properly. But um, we were lucky that Alicia was in Chile back in 2000 in the north of Chile and she made a harvest over there and she worked with the bats that we have today. And these bats are provided with, uh, with pistons in the top of the tank that very gently, they work by air and very, very gently in a slow motion press the skins inside the mast. This is a, a reproduction of the way fermentation was in concrete when someone had to punch down manually with... Uh, with uh, with a stick, the, the grapes, the, the cup of skins into the mast. These pistons work super slow motion, super efficiently, 
Normally, people would be better than machines, but in this case, this is irreplaceable because what you get is full structure, complex tannins, but also very, very uh, elegant tannins. Very, what we search is for finesse, elegance. That you, ones that will feed your palate, that will be mouth, mouthful, that will be gentle as well and elegant. It's, we search for savoriness. We want, we want the wines to be fresh and savory. That when you put the wines in the palate, they will say, you will say, wow, this is something natural. This is something fresh. I want to go for an exit. That's the idea. And uh, I don't know for how long I've been talking about uh, tandem. 20 minutes already, sorry. Um, something important too is that uh, the winery, the, the building is north facing. So we have the sun. Is, is going. We have a, we have a prominent skylight in the, in the in the front of the winery. Beautiful, like like this glass here, and this is north facing. So the sun is always behind us. So now it's going uh, all the way to the west. So we we do not need. Uh, we we are not um, affected by any direct sun exposures, and, and that's important to preserve the temperature inside. Plus, in the bottom of the state, we have the the San James Way, the, the Camino de Santiago. So if we have a look at the winery outside. Ben, if there is any trouble, please let me know. If we, if we go outside, we can see the, the valley in front of me, in front of us. And we can see this couple of hectares here, planted of uh, Cabernet. And this is the old road. And before the road is the San James Way. Uh, we, we are seeing already pilgrims again this year. But normally there will be around 60,000 plus pilgrims walking or biking by the winery. And this is really fantastic because it uh, gives you a sense of place, which is, is incredible. This is, these are the areas surrounding us, with the, the oak trees. And something important too, for you to understand the, uh, the continent. I say always that we are uh, in the very border, the boundary between uh, continental and Atlantic uh, influence weather because those mountains over there, the Sierras of Urbasa and Andia, close the appellation in the northwest. So, in the other side, it's still Navarra, but no more vines. And from here, if you take Google Earth and measure the distance to the Atlantic, uh, to the Bay of Biscay, it's just 50 kilometers. So, this is really the edge in between continental weather, kind of Mediterranean influence and Atlantic influence. That's why the, the wines had this kind of uh, continental mountain character. And uh, uh, this is basically something important too, is that Navarre is, is nestled in between uh, Bordeaux in France and uh, Rioja. Rioja is southwest of us. So we are in the road, which is the St. James Way, from Pamplona to Logroño. So if you ever visit the area, from Pamplona to the winery is just uh, 34 kilometers. From the winery to Logroño um, will be another probably 50, 50 kilometers or so. So we are approachable, we are easy to get here, and we, we are passionate about receiving people here at Tandem because uh, this is what we are. We want to show you everything, no, no secrets. And this is the winery. We try to see later the concrete tanks, but this is the, the building full in concrete and below also underground we have the aging in oak uh, cellar so I, I hope uh, you can see it properly ben what do you think should we go on with the tasting or it's fantastic views out there jose and we've had one question in um regarding tempranillo um what would you say is the ideal climate for growing the grape as it seems to thrive in many different places yeah at the end it's like raising raising children in different countries maybe because i can tell you that uh, alicia consults a winery in rioja for many many years before tandem started and I, I said alicia no keep keep that consultancy because it can only be good good for us uh you know if you make wines in different places it can only get better for you and also for to grow our, ourselves and when alicia brings tempranillo from rioja is completely different to our Tempranillo. So terroir is, is a big difference. And 
I love particularly our tempranillos. We have to be humble, and this is, uh, as I said before, uh, uh, every, every day is a new exam, in a sense. But the tempranillos grown here are fantastic for this, for this style they have. But the tempranillos in, in Rioja, for me, completely different. And if you go to Rioja La Besa or Rioja Baja, completely different. You go to other parts of Navarra, absolutely a different wine. So it's, it's the same variety, but uh, I, I don't want to say that we are the best area to, to grow tempranillo, but probably one of the best. If you taste tempranillos from Rivera del Duero, some people fancy more this uh, chunky, full body style. Uh, of course, they can, be, they can be nice too. I, I, I like any wine that is properly made. So tempranillos can be made beautifully in many, many places. It's a, it's a very adaptable or great, quite resistant. Um, depends which style you like. You like, depending on where you like it. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, I'll let I, you I, taste I, the I, wines I said, now. I like freshness, but uh, uh, I like wines that are, you know, nice and enjoyable and yeah. well done. Uh, it's, it's fun to taste wines from other people and, and learn about the way people perform in different places. So that's, that's a beautiful thing about wine that is not just a, a formula. I can, I can easily say that uh, anyone can get the grapes that we, or go to the, 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 the vineyard where, where we get the Tempranillo. And we, we can say, this is for you this year. And they can probably make the wine from those grapes um, in a different origin in this winery and be completely a different thing. First of all, because Alicia is passionate about her job and he's very stubborn. She's a little mule. <laughs> when the harvest arrives, we uh, normally growers uh, work by, by, you know, by ear. They see people picking and they push Alicia. Alicia, we have to pick already. Uh, there may be some rain next week and we have to pick. This is ready. So we go there to the vines. Even if Alicia has been the day before or whatever, because also uh, growers are a little bit uh, stubborn, as you may imagine. And uh, uh, we, go, we go there and we pick, we pick samples. And for Alicia, it's not just the analysis of the grapes. It's not the phenolic ripeness. For Alicia, it's the, it's the, the taste of the grapes that sometimes we are there and I say, Alicia, this is ready, it's beautiful. But she would say to me, chew the pip. And I, I chew the pip, which is something difficult to assess. And she would say to me, don't you find that it's a little bit green it's still there? Maybe, maybe. But so most of the people has already picked and we are still waiting because we search for complete ripeness, no green notes in the wines because we don't want to take any risk when the wine is finished to find any green notes. So when you find vegetal notes in our wines, it's not green notes. Sometimes it's something that we have to, yeah. to differentiate. Very fine art. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I'll Thank leave you some wines now, Jose. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we have selected three, three of our wines. Probably I would say this is the, the core of, uh, of the tandem wines. And uh, we are going to start with uh, with the white, a little baby. When we the name of the wine is Immacula. When we started uh, tandem back in two thousand three, as I said before, we found Pedro, and Al Pedro had Tempranillo, Cabernet, and Merlot. There were no white grapes, and I always thought about uh, cork, no screwed up. I always thought about wines aged in oak, no are no grades like we have today. And we didn't have the ability to produce a white because we didn't buy any grape at that year. It was just, just pedals, so just reds. But uh, after certain years, we said maybe in the future we have to, to have, we must have a white wine from Tandem, something that will be completely different. We do not want to make another Navarra wine. This, these wines are not another uh, Chardonnay, not another Tempranillo. We want to do things different. I define tandem sometimes as we, we are like salmons. We want to go against the stream. People want to do whatever. No, we want to do something different because we could stay otherwise in, in, in a big winery as we were before, working for good people and having a good salary and less uh, head, headaches in a sense. But 
we took the the path of passion and uh, there is only one way of taking the path of passion and is doing it with passion and this means doing things different so luckily in 2007 pedro said i have a couple of hectares up in the mountains so if we are 600 kilo, uh, meters altitude uh, this uh, vines could be a 650 or so. You can only get there with a tractor, with a four by four or by foot, and maybe we can plant something over there. And we said, let's let's plant a white grape. And I should maybe not say this because uh, it's not permitted by the appellation yet. But uh, as you know, is what we are, and we don't want to hide anything. The only thing is that we cannot mention on the label. We are not mentioning the uh, the variety. Uh, we decided to to try with something different. We, as I said before, we didn't want another Chardonnay. We didn't want another, just a simple Viura at that time. So we opted for Viognier. Viognier is not. It is starting starting to be in the process to be authorized by the Appellation of Origin, and uh, hopefully, hopefully in a few years from now, it will be accepted finally, and we will be able to put it on the label. So we have about 1.5, 1.8 hectares of Pionier up in the mountains. So since uh, 2011, we had the, the first harvest. Bunches were such a delicacy, so beautiful. I mean, colorful. Uh, the aromas were so intriguing, so beautiful that we said, I think we think we have made the right choice because this Viognier adapts beautifully to this uh, cool, cool climate. But in order to be, because the, wine, the vines were so young, um, we decided yeah, we decided for a fermentation because it was a small quantity. We needed a small uh, container to ferment. We, can, we couldn't ferment in a stainless steel. The smallest is, is 15,000 liters. So we decided to ferment the Viognier in French oak. We decided we only use uh, 300 liters uh, barrels, big casks, because always the philosophy we have is that we want the oak to be in the background, not to be aggressive. And we use French oak because we prefer the spices and the elegance of the French oak compared to the vanilla, coconut. We don't want those for a wine. I mean, it doesn't work for us. And uh, Alicia decided to use, instead of uh, new French oak, used because that will help the oak to be just a container with a little bit of uh, hints of, of the, the oak in the wine. So it's, it was fermented in French oak. All, uh, I didn't mention before, we do all wild yeast. So it's just a natural process down in the cellar you saw before where we have the barrels and the ground. When we had the wine, we said it could be a good idea to add something from, um, uh, from it's not when once it was it was made it was through uh, its vinification. It would be a good idea to to pick some grapes that would be certain age and could add certain complexity into the blend. And we found a Viura that was 30, 30 years old already back in two thousand eleven, so it's almost forty today. Uh, work um, uh, eco, uh, eco of, uh, work in the vines, and uh, it was a beautiful. Uh, 2.5 hectares state. And th that Viura, we fermented, it was only probably 2,000 kilos we picked. It was fermented in a stainless steel. So the fermentation was in oak for the Viognier, in stainless steel for the Viura. We would do work with the, uh, with the fine leaves, doing batonnage for about four months in the barrels, for about, for about three months in stainless steel. And we made the final blend. The final blend of the 85% Viognier and the 15% Viura worked beautifully. And we have kept this percentage all these years until the 2016 we have today. We will soon release the 2017. So the name in Macula is a beautiful name as well, uh, linked to Latin. You saw before that uh, we name it uh, Tandem. Most of the wines have Latin names. In Macula, in Latin means uh, without blemish, without stain, immaculate. And, um, uh, I'm going to show you a way to open the bottle on, on a screw cup that a sommelier from Ukraine uh, taught me some years ago and that makes it a bit more fancy. I thought 
how to open the bottle this way to my daughter who is now seven and I cannot leave any bottle on the on the table because she will open anything that's that is on the table at her uh, you know reach and it's just pulling a little bit from here and simply from the golden part turn gently and then you hang open just like this because sometimes for certain sommeliers particularly in Spain opening a bottle of uh, on a screw top is not fancy uh, this is not the same in the UK but uh, or in many other countries but it's, it's such a thing in Spain that uh, top points have to be linked to 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 cork so this is the wine it has a beautiful yellow pale color very 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 elegant when i tasted wines and i have learned uh, about the wine particularly with uh, uk sommeliers with uk professionals they always say to me oh, say, this is completely different this is not a viognier from uh, you know parts of france quadro from central part of spain this is much more elegant and fresh it's, it's much more subtle it's not the the power that uni has in other areas so it's, it's very very elegant in the in the nose you find the the citric notes the um, some uh, tropical fruit you find the kind of a spices uh, arriving from the from the touch of oak i didn't mention that after the fermentation uh, we do the patronage uh, for about four months we may keep the wine another two months in in the french bottles something important too is that this minimal intervention pays off because these wines one thing they do is that they can be kept for long they can be kept for for years before for being open and they will you know live long but once open also these wines are not just one impression they they keep going they keep showing and this is something that i particularly enjoy kind of uh, honey notes as well and then in the palette maybe professionals out there can help me better than me but uh, it's, it's very it's very gentle in the palate very mouth feeling the acidity is bright I mean all these flavors linger in the palate and follow through and have like a little the, the, the backbone I mean the aftertaste is, is super long and then your tongue is, is filled with the wine and your, your mouth is filled with the wine and you feel like having something with this you can my wine is not uh, super cold which is maybe better for tasting but I can I can drink it, drink it on its own and I can enjoy it with uh, with almost anything so one that would do fantastic with uh, with fish with uh, with um, you know salads with uh, pasta with uh, some types of cheese has some some earthy notes also we always say that these wines have this this mountain character i don't know if uh, you want to post any comments or anything arising over there the production is very limited because we only have the 1.8 hectares in the, in the mountains and this was only the 2016 was a bit wider 9000 something bottles i have bottled 2800 something so each bottle is, is numbered. As I said, this is probably the, one of the last bottles we have in the winery because now we, are move, we have moved to 2017, will be the next vintage on, on you guys. And um, why, why do you choose to leave it in the bottle for a few years? And when do you decide that that is the right time to release it? Uh, in the bottle, you mean? Yeah. We, we, uh, we do not keep it in the bottle for so long. When, when we are ready with the final blend with the viewer, we bottle the wine. For instance, the 2017 at the moment is almost finished at the winery and we have already bottled the 2018. Ah. But I'm, I'm going to tell you something which is pretty unique and I'm, I still, as I said before, we keep learning, we keep learning. I was before uh, coming up here to this dining room 
for the tasting and setting up everything. I went to have a look into the concrete and everything to check everything is fine. And I went into the aging in oak cellar where we have a couple of bottles, no, four, six bottles, sorry, six bottles uh, of Biura because this year, 2019, that's vintage, we also did some Biura on oak. Uh, as we do wild yeast, Alicia, whenever the vintage is finished, says to me, it's the last year we are going to use wild yeast. We are going to use, uh, we are not going to use anything. We are going to use next year some uh, neutral yeast or something because it, this drives me crazy. Well, at the end, she calms down and she agrees with me, it's much better for the wines. What I found, and it's not the first day, is that in the barrels, there is still activity. They're still fermenting. Wow. They stopped the fermentation, that Viura, the, the Viognier finished, uh, you know, like good guys. But the Viura finished fermentation. It was still sweet. And Alicia is when she said, next year, neutral yeast. She said, calm down, take it easy, let's see what happens. Later on, probably around uh, when lockdown was about to be finished, so they took like a break, they started the activity again. And probably they were doing at uh, uh, the same time the alcoholic, finishing the alcoholic and the malolactic conversion. And I saw one of the cups in one of the barrels in the floor. So wow. still, still fermenting. Astonishing. So what was the question, sorry? <laughs> That's very wild yeast. Um, <laughs> I have one more question. Viognier um, is well known for losing acidity when it ripens. Um, your wine really retains it. Is that purely the altitude and the effect of the cold nights that mis retains the acidity? Absolutely. I, I have not been able to work in a winery in, in a different climate that would produce Viognier, but uh, in here, uh, the acidity is there naturally, and we are so proud of that because uh, yeah. uh, I have, uh, I'm, I'm also a customer. I also drink wines. It, it would be shocking for anybody coming here with us and check the booklets that people that sell product for wineries brings to us to buy products for the fermentation, for the, for the harvest. And this is scary. Um, that's why I tell my friends when they say, no, I don't know about wine. Do you know about uh, patatas con chorizo or paella? Do you cook? But, but you enjoy having them, right? So don't say that you, if you fancy, if you ask for one, if you drink it, you already have some steps, uh, you know, done. And you can enjoy wine without making it. I'm not a winemaker and I enjoy wine fully. Well, I, I can play as a winemaker because I, with Alicia, we work in everything together. But yeah. mm -hmm. So, um, I'm a bit lost in the, in the point, but uh, <laughs> here, yeah, the, the natural acidity. I have, as a, as a customer, I have drunk sometimes wines that uh, uh, it felt bad. It felt the acidity, I mean, going down immediately. It, it, it was painful in, in my brain uh, the next day. I had, a, I had the worst uh, night at night. What are they, they using in, in, in the process? It's, it's a little bit scary. So being uh, in a natural way, uh, you know, blessed with the perfect conditions to, to grow certain varieties is, is incredible. Yeah. I, I wouldn't do, my, my passion is, is product. My passion is wine. Uh, we, we took, as I said before, the train of adventure of passion. Of, we, have, we have taken so many steps to get here and we will never betray our principles. Um, of course, sometimes you go to people and they may not understand you because this is not another one, just that. It's a little bit different. But sometimes it's also a paradox because people would say, no, your wives are very modern. Yes, they could be modern for some people, but we're making them in the same way, in the same way they were done 100 years ago. The only thing we use here is sulfites to a minimum. That's it. Nothing else used in the winery. So th that's a... That's, uh, that's heaven for me. Yeah. If I had to work in a winery in a different area in which we need to correct, do things, uh, I would be feeling bad. Yeah, definitely. So I think the wine, this wine particularly is a white wine, which is uh, the dangerous zone for, zone for me is, is rather in white wines more than in red wines. Although sometimes I also taste wines that are very oxidized and, and so no, are very acidic. But in white wines, it's very, uh, it's you know, like, like an upfront thing. So mm. having a natural wine is something incredible. 
And as I said, can, can we make this wine in, in big quantities? We can't. We cannot reproduce this. Uh, we, don't, we don't have the pressure from the market. We do not offer this to certain customers because we cannot. We simply don't have enough. Maybe one day we will be powerful and have big land to say, let's plant another five hectares or 10 hectares and then we can grow. But for the moment, this is what, what it is. Definitely. Um, I'll let you move on to red wines now. Okay, so that's in my blood. And now we go to Ars in vitro. Ars in vitro is in Latin art in glass. We have the 2017 and in here, yes, we can mention the varietals. It's a blend of Tempranillo and Merlot. And this is our, in principle, in theory, entry level but it's not just another uh, young red wine. It's something completely different because the wine is, as you can see here in the side of the bottle, is being kept in concrete for two years. All the reds we produce are kept for a minimum of two years in concrete tanks. And I explain why. This is our house wine. My wife, Christina, and I drink this wine every day, every night, every lunch, if I'm at home, uh, since uh, so many years. And whenever I bring another wine, she says, no, 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 this is not for me. So she and I, we have gotten very used to Ars in vitro. Uh, when we started, as I said before, it was only cork, it was only wines, uh, gin oak, and uh, there was also, it started with the UK, there was a demand for a tandem wine that will be an oak trying to enter the wine butter glass uh, business with, with the Asnova, but probably above the uh, body glass uh, possibilities to be, to be there. So we said, Alicia and I, uh, if we, if we uh, make the wines a little bit uh, cooler in the fermentation, about, about 25 degrees or so, extracting more fruit instead of more, um, more body structure, but focus on fruit, and then we keep the wine in concrete for a certain time, we may hit the idea that we have to produce a different entry level. And that was the idea, that was the beginning. Uh, we offered some wines in the beginning with another brand to the UK, and it was successful. And then we started thinking about the brand, and it came because we had the Ars Nova, uh, with the Ars Ward, a little bit tricky for the UK, I know. Uh, I said, I put some names to my wife one day and one of the names was Ars in vitro and she liked it um, and I picked it. Ars in vitro, art in glass, like an idea of something a bit more, you know, casual, loose, easy going. And since the beginning, the blend has been Tempranillo, which is most of it is between 85 and 90 percent and a touch of Merlot. And uh, these Tempranillos, I was discussing this before with somebody, uh, all our wines are plot wines because every year the Tempranillo that we use for Ars in vitro, the Tempranillo we use for Ars Nova, comes from the same vineyard. It's always the same vine, the same vine grower, the same process, the same care, and almost the same microclimate. And this is, this is a gift for us. So after the fermentation is still and still, without pumps, just punching down very gently, searching for fruit finesse. We rack the wines, the Tempranillo on one side, the Merlot on the other side, by gravity down to concrete. And we do the single fermentation in concrete, the more lactic conversion, and we do something very unique, the two years in concrete. Why do we keep the wines in concrete for so long? To avoid fining, as I explained before. All these wines have nothing by, but minimum sulfates, nothing else. And uh, the result, uh, I've been traveling the world. We export to about 25 markets. Uh, I've been in tastings with uh, fellow winemakers and wineries, uh, tasting wines from others. I have never seen anything like this in the market. A proposal of a wine that is, uh, is an entry level with an affordable price, that's been two years in concrete and has this complexity. For me, this is, uh, a mountain wine with this character of, of the land we have here, the stones, the wild herbs. This, 
this beautiful uh, amount of uh, red berries and this fruit, this wild fruit, this, uh, this uh, bush, like kind of uh, low bush, kind of forest. And then again, when you put the one in the palette, fulfill, fulfill your, your mouth completely, goes down, but it goes back again. It's savory, it's tasty. Again, I don't have the wine too cool. We fancy at home drinking this wine at about, even cool, like 16 degrees or so, because, because it comes from this cold climate, it, it benefits from this fresh uh, temperature. And it's tasty, and it's, um, it's easy going, and it's also complex. I don't know if there is any comments, uh, there are any comments uh, from anybody out there. But what we, it is, as I said before, it's already changing. You have the first impression when you, you open the wine, but then it keeps going, it keeps going, and then you go back to the glass, and you start finding new notes. It's something that we particularly love, you know, that the wine is not just one picture. Sometimes you can drink wines that you open and instead of growing, they go down. These wines are the, completely the opposite. They keep going and they keep going. And um, for me, Ars In Vitro is a perfect company for anything. Uh, it's a, you can have with this wine anything from, from, any, from vegetables, salad, charcuterie, uh, you can have uh, any kind of omelette, paella, fish, meat, anything. I call it, when I'm in tastings with friends and customers, I call it the joker because it can play any card. You, can, you don't need to think about pairing this wine with anything. It matches whatever. You can enjoy with, uh, with anything. We, when we are at home, there is no need to, to think about matching the, the wine with the food. With us in vitro, is anything. Does, um, Jose, does the f freshness in the wine come from mainly the Merlot or the Tempranillo in there? We, we always do the, of course, we always or do both. the taste, you know, the Tempranillo, the Merlot, and uh, sometimes we thought about doing maybe just the Tempranillo, but the addition of the 10%, 15% Merlot, it gets, <laughs> the wine gains more, more complexity in a sense. In a sense, the fruit of the Tempranillo will be for us too, too upfront, too straight, and we want to give more a wide you know, array of things, of uh, aromas and flavors around. And the, the Merlot does that. It's, it's a grape on its own that uh, we don't have any Merlot, uh, 100% varietal uh, Merlot, but on the blends for us works beautifully. And with Tempranillo, in fact, I don't see many wines around of this blend. Mm. Because it's Tempranillo 85, 90%, we could name the wine as Tempranillo because about above 80%, you can name it one single variety. But we, as I said before, we want to be transparent. We show everything. Anyone can come to a winery in the harvest, in uh, any time of the year. We are open and happy to receive people because we, don't, we have nothing to hide. Some people come in and say, it's very clean. Did you clean it for my visit? <laughs> no, it's, it's always like this. It, when I go in a winery and it smells weird, it starts to be scary because normally this will indicate that something weird may be in the wines later. It needs to be absolutely proper. And Alicia is very, again, stubborn on this. So for me, RC Vitro is, is completely, I'm very proud of this because it, of course, in Macula it's different, yes, but in a young red, doing something different is not that easy. It's not that easy. Maybe we've been able to do this because in the beginning, in the tough years of the crisis uh, that hit Spain, as you know, badly, we didn't have much pressure from the market. And we couldn't say to our grower partner, Pedro, we don't take all your grapes this year. So we had to make all the wines. We, we had to sacrifice everything before uh, the grapes, the grapes have to be there, the wines have to be there. So that's how we experimented in concrete. That's how we could uh, have less pressure from the market to keep the wine in concrete 
and learn things because you keep always learning things. One thing that is important, and I must say that, as I said before, any process that you make to wine makes a difference. And uh, even when we bottle, we are three people. And we are bottling, when you use pumps, we use pumps that are very gentle, just uh, 12,000 liters per hour. So what we do, we're bottling by gravity. Again, when we have the wines already uh, made the blend, keep the wine in concrete for long, so the blend will be, you know, starting to round and get, uh, you know, complex enough or whatever. We make, with one single pump, we bring the wine up to, go to stainless steel, and then because the bottling line is in the lower story, by gravity, we bottle. We bottle at above about uh, 1,700 bottles per hour with a minimal filtration before bottling on plagues to have the wine clean, that's it. We don't want to have any, uh, you know, dust or whatever. So just to have it clean, we, we say that we do not filter because it's just uh, uh, to have the wine bright. And you can go in the bottling line, take a bottle and go for lunch. The wine's not suffering. When I was in a big winery, there was microfiltration, big pumps, uh, the wine would be go from here and there. And at the end, we, after bottling, we had to keep the wine for at least 10 days uh, settling down because it suffered so much that it was, you know, like knocked out. No? So this is completely different. We, in every step we take, we care absolutely because every bottle means everything to us. Brilliant. <laughs> you speak with such passion, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 can, I can't avoid it. It's my <laughs> You've been doing it a while, it's, it's quite fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll let Great. you move to the next one now. Thank you, Heiser. Yes, it's such an honor uh, being here. I mean, yeah. I know that uh, in Spain, how many wineries, uh, 4,000 or 5,000 wineries, I'm here. That's a lot to me. And um, the way and the respect that we receive to our job from other markets, from other countries, from other customers elsewhere, is so incredible that we can only be humbled and blessed and say thank you and correspond. And the way we can correspond is doing wines, you know, every, I, I tell Alicia, Alicia, uh, push me. Uh, tell me that you have found certain garnacha that is uh, incredible somewhere else and we have to buy it. Uh, experiment with this, it's the only way. Uh, of course, we, you have to be careful with your already, uh, you know, space that you have progressed, but steadily you have to improve. So, the last one is Ars Nova. I don't know if you can see the bottle. New Art. This is such a beautiful name. A friend of, me, of mine, uh, back in 2000, in the very beginning, when we were starting with everything, 2002, 2003, um, I was searching for names for the winery, for the wines. In principle, the idea was to have only two wines, uh, AG Nong, as I said before, on cork. And a friend of mine, um, he's a piano teacher and he also teaches uh, com composition in music and one day he came to me and, say, and said Ars Nova wow that's super beautiful what, what is it? it's Art Nouveau New Art in Latin is the name given to the beginning of polyphony back in the 14th, 14th uh, century to music before the 14th century music was like Gregorian music was flat there's was no no complexity, no layers. From the 14th century onwards, the movement in Italy, in France and Germany uh, finished in the arrival of, of volume into music. This new way of making music more complex was named Ars Nova and whatever they did before was named Ars Antiqua. Boom. We have a name for our first wine because it's, it's so important to make wines beautiful but also so important to to label them and to, you know, to dress them in a proper way so customers would understand that we have taken care in every step. It's not just a marketing, th marketing thing like, like big wineries because we cannot have uh, that budget. It's just uh, you know, a lot of uh, thinking and you know, taking care of every single step. So as Noah, I have to open a bottle here on cork because we, this, we do this wine both on cork and screw cup. In the UK, it's on, on Skruka. And I'm so pleased. If I could, 
I will do everything a shortcut, but you know, sometimes in some markets like Spain, it's difficult. So in, here in, the, in this side of the, of the label, you can see the label varieties, Tempranillo, Cabernet, and Merlot, 40, 40, 20. It's a typical uh, uh, blend in, in Navarra for a Crianza, although we do not name the wine as Crianza. We name it as uh, Tinto. It's 14% uh, alcohol, and this, this wine, again, was kept uh, different varieties in concrete for minimum two years for natural fining and gaining complexity and keeping the fruit. Then we make the funnel. Then, uh, before we used to make the blend and put it in, in oak, now we do different. Now we separately age the, uh, each variety in, in oak and then those wines will go back in concrete and we will make the final blend. And it spent uh, nine months in French oak. So Ars Nova, sorry that I put a wine, is probably the flagship of, of Tandem. It summarizes a little bit the style of, uh, of Tandem wines, of uh, this kind of uh, elegance, femininity, subtleness, is super elegant. Has a, our wines have not this super deep color, also not light, no, it has a medium high uh, depth. And then in the nose, there's, I mean, again, this, this mountain character. Uh, here you can find more spices, more kind of wild herbs. The, as in the Tempranillo Merlot in the Arce Vitro, here is the addition of Cabernet with this kind of um, Cabernet. Merlot is more floral for us. Cabernet is more kind of uh, hay, like going into a barn. If you remember when we were children and now there are not so many barns, but uh, smelling this kind of uh, uh, barn. And then the, the red fruits coming from the Tempranillo and all in one make a beautiful blend, very complex, very, again, very mountain, very, very subtle. Then in the palette. You find also the, the oak addition, the oak element, but very subtle, very gentle. It's nothing that is uh, over, uh, overpowering the, or on top of the, of the wine. The wine comes first, fruit comes first. It's very, very elegant in the, in the, in the bottom of the palette, very present over there. And it's super gentle, super feminine, and brings me forward and willing to have another bite and I don't have food with me and have another, another glass, uh, another sip of the wine. It's very, very elegant. It's another style of uh, Navarra Crianza. It's not, not just another Crianza. And I humbly believe that uh, Arzlova made Tandem a little bit famous in, in many, many markets. These two wines, Ars in Vitro and Ars Nova, are, I would say, in any market in which we are. Uh, some markets will not buy the white Immacula because uh, they produce in their country, produce white. I mean, but Ars Nova, Ars In Vitro uh, are, you know, are probably our top lines. Searching more for an everyday style for Ars In Vitro, Ars Nova is probably a bit more occasional. Uh, um, thank you for the comments. I couldn't read everything, but uh, thank you. Um, this is probably as well to me is, is maybe not for every day here I can think a little bit more on the food you can, uh, me particularly enjoy with uh, with something a little bit spicy with uh, um, people fancies this one with lamb and meat I particularly with uh, complex pasta when we make uh, complex past pasta at home savory pasta with uh, Arsenova, I think it's an incredible blend because I mean it makes in a sense, makes food better. That's the idea of, of our wines. We want to make the experience at the table better. Sometimes a wine can spoil a good lunch, and uh, that's terrible to me. We want not to be the main thing on the table, but to, to drive things farther. It's like a, you know, like a boost. Wow, this, 
I'm, I'm getting more flavors. I'm getting more complexity around uh, an array of, uh, of, of, you know, sensations. And that's uh, basically, basically it. I mean, there is a lot to say about, uh, about Tandem and, and the Camino and, and Alicia and me, our passion. Of course, as I said before, we are a boutique winery. It's such an honor be working with, uh, with you and having you today in uh, uh, tasting the wine with me. Uh, your support is, you know, second to nothing. It's so important for us. For us, every bottle counts, every bottle. And uh, it's a privilege. And if you ever happen to be in the north of Spain, in the north of uh, the Appalachian Navarra, it will be a pleasure having you at the winery anytime. You have my contacts. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, today's another world compared to 2003, where we didn't have these tools. And Ben knows very well. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the tasting. I don't know if there are any questions or something that we can. That's, that's fantastic, Jose. Thank you very much. It's been very inspirational and insightful. Um, I, for one, am personally very much looking forward to coming out and visiting in Navarra. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. It Thank would be such a pleasure. pleasure. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much, Jose. Thank you, everybody, for watching tonight. Thank pleasure. you, everybody. And as I said, it's an honest invitation to be back to be uh, visiting us any moment, it will be a pleasure. And I hope, and of course, and of course, sorry, I hope to be back in the UK very shortly. When yes, we hope get... to welcome you back soon as well. Stay safe and uh, thank you for your support with our wives. You, you too. Thank you, Jose. Take care. Bye. Thank you.